like you said, a uh, lot of the lot of what we know about asteroids in the media, etc., is about it's going to kill us, it may kill us, and so on. But asteroids are also important for astronomy to understand where we came from as a solar system. So I'll talk a little bit about all of those, and then when we go down, of course, we can continue the discussion. Okay. Uh, Huh? Okay, good. Everybody seen this video? No, right? So asteroids are basically rocks, right? And the reason they are important for astrophysics is because uh, they formed along with the solar system when they when solar system formed around four and a half billion years ago, a bit earlier, right? And therefore, asteroids are important astrophysically because they they are uh, they are remnant or leftovers of the solar system itself. And some of the asteroids which haven't had anything happen to them since then, it, uh, basically is a fossil record of the material from which the solar system itself formed, right? As our planets, for example, you cannot really say from our planets how the solar system, uh, the material was because the planets, planets have been heated up from within, they've been bombarded, the chemical composition has changed, the pressure has made new material, the inner part is molten, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, right? So we lost the history of the material composition which made the solar system from planets. Five star UM? I don't know. UM, I don't know. Five kilometers roughly. I think UM is, uh, so the UM is, I don't know what it stands for, but these are objects which are recreated from the site. So so the Chihlu crater, Redford crater, etc. are craters from which you kind of estimate how big the asteroid is. So those are fake, right? But the deep impact clearly is fake. Halley is partly made because we had a flyby to Halley. Other, the smaller asteroids are actual pictures. And I'll show you as we go along, right? Great Comet, again, it's, it's a recreation, right? It's because we don't know how, we didn't fly past it. Uh, Ganymede is an asteroid, again, as a recreation. Hale-Bopp, again, is a recreation. Right, and Chiron is an asteroid, right? So Centaur, Centaurs are a class of asteroid. We'll talk about if there is time. Chariklo is one of the, I think, second biggest uh, Centaur there is. Uh, Hector is the asteroid which follows in the orbit of Jupiter, and we'll talk about it if we have time. There are two, right? The two, yeah, two sets of torches. Yeah. Okay, so. Asteroids can be of various sizes, right? Uh, these are leftover rocks, remember. And therefore, they can be as small as one meter. They can be as big as a few hundred reaching to almost 1,000 kilometers, right? And they all they come in all shapes. Also. If you look at these are the 42 largest asteroids, uh, which are imaged by the Very Large Telescope uh, in Chile. Now, you can make out that the shapes are very different. Why do you think shapes are different? Why are they all spherical rocks? Yeah, you first. When asteroids uh, make in the space, like if they come close to like uh, outer the layers of the atmosphere of any planet, the heat there, it uh, like you know, sir, it uh, breaks down some of the outer parts. Mm -hmm. Not quite, not quite. We'll, yeah, you, so you had a, so one of you had a response. Huh? Collisions. Collisions is one. So when they collide, they break up and then they break up into various shapes. That's one reason. There's one more reason. Very important. Yeah, yeah, please. When they firstly have three collisions, most of the time the object that breaks up is irregular in shape and is never spherical. Mm. But uh, after, like, let's say several million years, even like after very long periods of time, we don't need its own gravitational force of attraction with compacts it into, this, into a circle because the circular shape is one where it's like, well, each point on the outside of the circle is equidistant to the center. Equipotential, right? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that. Yeah. So, so yeah. So basically, the idea is you're right. So the two reasons why they are of all shapes and sizes. The primary reason is that asteroids are too small to become spherical. Why are our planets spherical? Because the whole planet was molten at some point. Why was it molten? Because enough heat produced inside. And once it's molten, it's going to acquire a spherical shape that you know, right? The asteroid, none of these asteroids are big enough or had enough gravity or enough heat to melt or, or to become spherical because of the pressure of its own gravity. Therefore, they remain in the shapes they formed by accreting objects in long, long back. The other reason, of course, is asteroids collide. And when they collide, they shatter into pieces. Those pieces are also various shapes, okay? Now, I'm going to go faster, okay? So, we'll, we'll, you know, that the talk has begun, we'll go a bit fast, else you won't be able to throw stones, okay? So, you also know that most asteroids are formed between Mars and Jupiter, but not all. Majority are, form, are formed between Mars, Mars and Jupiter. So, the idea is, do they form, do they form, right, 
Do they all form between Mars and Jupiter? If so, why? Or they form elsewhere and they all collected into Mars and Jupiter? Or the asteroids formed elsewhere go away, etc. So these are some things we can try and answer as we go along, right? Because, because if you say that the asteroids formed only between Mars and Jupiter, that's a bit strange. Then you had explained why that is so, right? So asteroids are also of three main kinds, right? So what are they composed of? Asteroids are not just, uh, if you look at our stones on Earth, even geologically, our stones are all not identical. They have various compositions, similarly for asteroids, right? Yeah, wait, I'm coming to that. Okay. So the, the most, the most, uh, the most common asteroids are silicate or carbonaceous. So what do we mean by stone in, in, in on Earth is basically silicates, right? So silicates and, and oxygen mix, silica plus oxygen, they form multiple silicates. And then they form these small things and they used to form small things in space called chondrules. And you can see an example uh, below, right? Uh, the, the bottom left is a chondrule, carbonaceous chondrite with chondrules in it. And, so, and that's another one which is blown up uh, on the right side, you can make out the small, small things. Those are contours formed in, in, in the solar system nebula long, long back and have never melted ever since, right? And the second most common is carbonaceous, which is which is which are darker, which are darker in color. And uh, these are mainly, mainly have carbon, right? And a small number of asteroids, which are purely, almost purely metal, right? And metal basically means iron, nickel, tungsten, cobalt, and so on. So why are there different types of, why are they different types? Do they form differently or do they, what happened to them is another question. So all of these is astrophysics. I've not come to impacts and killing, killing life yet, right? Okay. So this kind of answers a little bit of some, some, some questions we asked, right? So if you look at distance from the sun, you find that the, the silicates or the stony things occur closer to the sun, right? The carbonaceous asteroids occur slightly far away from the sun, mainly between Mars and Jupiter. And the metallic ones kind of occur in between. And the P, D, E, and I, you forget, those are like very uh, esoteric asteroids, right? So what happens is that, so, so therefore, different types of asteroids are clearly found at different distances of the sun. Now, therefore, what does that tell you? It tells you that the formation is different depending on the sun's distance of the sun. And what happens if you change the distance of the sun? The heat. Right, primarily heat. Therefore, we know that the heat is probably the reason why the composition varies as you go out, 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 outwards from the sun. Right, and this is because when that's if the asteroids are big enough, uh, then they they then there's enough heat produced inside due to radioactivity, like our Earth, and therefore it starts melting. Once it melts, what happens? The heavier elements settle to the center. The lighter elements go outside. Right, and therefore asteroids which are nearer the sun undergo this process called differentiation due to heat, right? And then therefore you, and then you are able to produce silicate material on the surface, right? And the core is more metal and the silicate surface goes away because of collisions, you're left with only the metal asteroid. The asteroids which are farther away haven't differentiated because there's not enough heat and therefore they retain and therefore they're full of carbon, which is the, which is one of the major elements in the solar system nebula, okay? And the metal is mixed inside, mixed with it. It hasn't had a chance to settle down, right? And therefore, and this is all of you, therefore, just to recap how the solar system formed, we know that around 4.5 billion years ago, there was a gas nebula, right? And which, which then started which then started collapsing due to some perturbation. The, in, the inner, of course, more and more matter accumulated in the center. And as it became more heavier, it be, had more, became more massive, it became hotter and it be, had more gravity. Therefore, it, it became attracted even more mass and it grew like that till it reached a, a, a threshold where the heat was so high inside because of the pressure that nuclear fusion or fission? Fission. fission or fusion? Fusion started, right? And then it became a star, star right? A sun is a star, right? So a star is where nuclear fusion is, is, is uh, opposing gravity, self-gravity, right? And then what happened to the rest of the things around it? The rest of the things around it started, was also going on a disk and they started accreting around heavier objects, which became heavier and heavier and attracted even more objects because they were, they had more mass and these formed the planets and what was left over, which could not accrete to for, accrete onto larger objects to become a planet, they got planetesimals, they became the asteroids, right? And, and some of them, which are a bit farther away, retain their ice and water because they could be heated and therefore they became comets outside, right? Yeah. So what's the star? Star, sir? Growing or glowing? <laughs> I don't understand. Glowing or growing? Bigger. Bigger. Shining. Glowing, shining. So all stars, all stars shine because there's nuclear fusion in the center because it's high, very high temperature inside because of the pressure. And nuclear fusion 
for example, it was in a sun, you have you have hydrogen nuclei or protons combining to form. How many protons combine to form a helium nucleus? Helium. How many nucleons are there in the helium nucleus? Neutron plus proton. How many neutrons? How many protons? Uh, one, two, one, two, and zero helium. Helium. How is one proton? Helium. And ha. Huh. So you need four protons to come together to form a helium nucleus. In the process, there's some binding energy which is lost, and that is lost in terms of energy. And that energy is in emitted in form of gamma rays and neutrinos. And that energy is what comes out of the surface and then comes out as light, right? So what what powers a star is nuclear the the energy released during nuclear fusion, right? Because it has excess energy, right? Now so at, stars just keep it burn. They don't see burn by on Earth. Burning is used when you have when you burn when you have carbon form combining with oxygen. So we say burning colloquially for the star is wrong, right? Nuclear fusion. It's a fusion reactor, so, right? Uh, so is there a limit on the uh, helium? Fusion? Okay, what I'm going to do now is already ten twenty. So I'm going to go through the presentation, okay, and then we'll take questions after. So just note down your questions, and we continue downstairs. Else we're going to be here forever, okay? So therefore. Asteroids are leftover material from from what is called the solar nebula, right? Which could not accrete onto a planet, right? Because because they either were colliding with each other all the time and breaking up, or or the planet's gravity was such that these rocks have were flung out somewhere else and therefore they could not attract uh, be attracted towards the planets, right? I'll ignore this. And therefore, to summarize what we learned so far, asteroids are leftover objects along with comets, right? And therefore, some of and therefore they some of them hold the same chemical composition as the nebula which formed the solar system. It's primordial chemical composition. And they could not grow, grow into planets, especially between Mars and Jupiter, because Jupiter's gravity is such that it doesn't let any asteroid come together. Right. So because of Jupiter's uh, Jupiter being so massive, it causes what are called orbital resonances in between Mars and Jupiter. Okay, And therefore, a lot of objects between Mars and Jupiter if they Jupiter doesn't let them come close and accrete to form larger masses, if they do, they get broken up again because of Jupiter's gravity. Okay, and that's why we don't we have asteroids between Mars and Jupiter because that's why they are broken up and they kept in orbit. Other asteroids elsewhere have dispersed or have come in or something, right? So they've been thrown out or thrown in by the other planets. Now, asteroids nearer the sun we saw could melt, and if they melt, the metals sink inside <laughs> to form a metallic core, and then silicate is on outside. Which is silica, which is basically silicon, oxygen, etc. And these are brighter objects, right? And asteroids farther away could not melt and retain the original composition of the solar system nebula, and they can be very porous, right? So if they don't melt, so if they don't melt, then the density is not that high, right? So then it retains all the so if something collides like this, and then they stick together, right? And there can be some cavities inside, there could be some holes inside, etc. And as it collects more and more matter, it's going to be porous. It's not going to melt and become a dense object. So they're called rubble heap asteroids, right? Because they're very, very porous. And therefore, the density, overall density can be very, very low, even though they're made of rocks. Okay. So somebody said minerals. So therefore, asteroids have a lot of minerals. So therefore, now, of course, you know, because we live in a capitalist society, uh, there are now people who are trying to see if you can mine an asteroid, right? And so uh, asteroids can be sources of a lot of heavy elements, the kind of elements you need to make semiconductor chips, rare elements on Earth, for example, osmium, iridium, platinum, palladium, rubium, rhodium, etc. These are these are essential for our semiconductor industries and, and so on and so forth. And then people are talking of ways, people are thinking of ways of going to an asteroid and then mining it and bringing some minerals back and things like that, right? So, so, so therefore these... The combustion of asteroids becomes also important because they hold so much metals from, from early on. So we've seen this already. These are VLT pictures of the largest asteroids. And as you can see, the larger asteroids are more spherical. Smaller asteroids are more misshapen. Again, because larger asteroids have had time to heat up, melt, and differentiate. Right. So now asteroids can be dangerous. So here is a here are two, it goes from there to there and again from bottom to bottom right. So you can see the ISS. ISS is very close by, and then there's a, there, there was a third, the 30 meter size asteroid, which is just outside the ISS, where GPS satellites are, which passed by on, on, in, uh, on 2013 and so on. So as you can see, there are a lot of asteroids which have passed, passed by close to Earth, even, which are even lower, lower than some of the extremely high satellites we have. Right? So, so this keeps happening often because of Earth's gravity. Right? Any passing by rock, 
will be attracted to earth by gravity and therefore it's not as if you know you either have a huge asteroid which kills all life or you have nothing at all or you have meteor showers you have a lot of middle sized asteroids which keep passing by earth but they come with such high velocity they don't fall into earth they just pass by fly by right and as you can see you know look the moon the last bit is the moon and you can see a lot of asteroids are passed between the moon and earth right so it's so you can get pretty close hmm? so this is for example a, a histogram of objects asteroids seen the yellow is asteroids we have seen just one day before it flew by with no warning because they're very very small and very faint right the red is less than 24 hour warning is yellow red is no warning no warning means you just discovered it where it was too close which means that we are in trouble right so therefore there are a lot of observatories and programs now which aim to observe identify and catalog every single asteroid which could potentially hit the earth there's a lot of programs called linear and neowise and so on which do this so now we have mapped every asteroid more than i think 150 kilometers we know all of them in the solar system right and but then the process has to go on because of millions of asteroids and so and so this process goes on to identify what are the asteroids which are nearby study them over a longer time to get their orbit predict their orbit and see if they could in principle come near the earth and then kind of you know have a and and therefore get advance warning right so this is the lot of projects going on including one telescope in hanley in ladakh i will tell you about right now we have sent spacecraft to asteroids do you know that yeah is that really cool asteroids are like few kilometers tens of kilometers and we had sent, sent spacecraft to it is very difficult right i mean such a small asteroid you could miss it completely right and we even landed on asteroids which is even more difficult because look at the size of the asteroid and we brought back samples high bosa yeah right so 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 these are very intricate maneuvers for for spacecraft to do and we've done that right so here is a flyby of matilda here is a flyby of eros eros is one of the largest asteroids i think third or fourth largest asteroid the flyby in truth but look at the shape right the shape is weird it doesn't had it doesn't was a mass enough to melt but look there are craters on the asteroid so what does it tell you other small asteroids are crashed into this asteroid as well right so that is because we have asteroids of all sizes in the solar system and like you would expect do you expect more larger asteroids or more smaller asteroids smaller. more smaller right small asteroids will be thousands of times more numerous than the larger asteroids so therefore any asteroid you have there will be smaller craters on its surface because there are always many more asteroids smaller than a given asteroid then larger right and this is quite intense i mean look at this right and this is this is uh, the galileo spacecraft where i think it went to went to jupiter it passed by an asteroid called ida and it, it discovered ida had its own moon which you can see on the right so asteroids can have its own moon right because asteroid is, has enough mass and there's a rock nearby which came at reasonably correct high velocity but not too high can be captured by the gravity of the asteroid i don't know. you can look it up uh but and therefore it could have its own moon which is i think quite surprising i was quite amazed when i found this out right so did you know how many of you knew that asteroids had moons ah okay you all know much more than i do <laughs> then this is an asteroid which came very close to earth in 2015 okay so this is a very cool thing what they do is how do you image an asteroid the image you can't image asteroid very easily because they're very small right and therefore if you make take an image there'll be a few pixels big on your camera on your telescope camera right and therefore you can't really tell the features well also it is not very also it's not very bright right so it's kind of darkish albedo is very low and so on so what they did is they had a radar in the us called goldstone radar it's a very powerful radar which sends out a very powerful you can send out a very powerful radio emission okay and then they blasted this asteroid with this radio right emission for let's say a second and then at some point it will come back to us right this they imaged using a radio interferometer okay which can make images which are much 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 more detailed than optical images are because the radio interferometer is spread over a large area and i can talk about that later down says if you want and then you could actually make it so this is basically imaging the echo of our own radar from the asteroid which we sent right and this asteroid has a moon as well when when so these are radar so you send a radar take an image every few tens of minutes and you could image the moon you can image the asteroid rotating and image the moon orbiting the asteroid is that really cool this is not because of its own like so you say you know objects objects reflect the light of the sun we see planets and comets and asteroids 
and and moons because they reflect the light of the sun. This is an asteroid we image because it reflects the light of our own radar. Isn't that cool? Right. In fact, this method is used to image even Jupiter and Saturn. Right. So in the radio, they even blast this radar onto Jupiter and Saturn, and they can image it back with this method. So that's a really really powerful radar. Yeah. Uh, can can uh, radar reflect light reflect asteroid reflect? If it is big enough, then yes. And we'll come to that. As a, uh, we'll come to man-made example of that at the end. Right? So do you, see, do you understand what this image is about? How this is made? This is imaging the echo. It's like what a bat does. Right? Uh, so what a bat does, it sends out so sound, sound waves. And then it forms an image from the reflected sound. Right? There's something similar. And therefore, we have asteroids reflecting man-made radar as well. Right? So... So these are all the, these are except Ceres and Vesta, which are too big to fit on the screen. These are actual to scale images of all the asteroids, which humans have visited. Okay. And as you can see, they are, the first thing, they're beautiful. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. And they all are various shapes and all of them have craters. Any asteroid of any shape has craters smaller than them. Right. And that, that's very interesting. So Hayabusa, I think that's what you mentioned, right? Was it's a Japanese spacecraft which landed on an asteroid, the first asteroid where we some where we landed a spacecraft called Itokawa, so three thirty meters big, and it's made of two asteroids which clumped together and then melted at the point where they where they clumped. You can make out left and right, and we know that the two different asteroids because the composition of the left and right part are slightly different. Okay, so if you if you make a radar image of them and look at the chemical composition, the left and right are very different. So they're two asteroids hit together, it fused a bit, and then it formed like this weird shape, potato shaped thing, right? Most asteroids look like potatoes, if you haven't noticed, right? And therefore, this is an example of asteroid, two distinct parts of roughly equal size, right? Again, it's, a, it's called a rubble pile because it's so porous and therefore density is very low as a whole, right? This is Ceres, the biggest asteroid. Now it's no longer called an asteroid. It's called a dwarf planet because of all the drama with Pluto you all are aware of. So I won't go, go about it. This is an image taken by Dawn, which, is, which flew by Ceres in, in 2015. right? And this is a very famous asteroid. Have you heard of Ryugu? This is a very famous asteroid because it was visited by Hayabasa too. And, and it dug in, got samples which were returned back to Earth. That's really cool, right? So the first time we have asteroid rocks which are which are gotten back to earth and they found amazing things on that they found around 20 amino acids they found vitamin b3 right b2 uracil you know uracil where is it ah uracil is found rnas liquid water etc so this was formed outside the extreme edge of solar system and brought in by gravity right that's really that's really amazing and this is a uh, you know many photos of of Ryugu taken by Hayabusa and put together to see how and see how it is rotating and look at it. I mean it's okay. Yeah. Liquid water was formed means that life can exist on it. It could, in principle. I mean, it does amino acids? Who knows? Huh. But then the life could life cannot be such that it needs oxygen or carbon dioxide. Clearly, it's not atmosphere, right? So a different kind of life could evolve, which. Exactly. How, depending on how you define life, there could be some life form we don't we do, we can't even imagine which could survive. Of course, uh, but we don't we don't have any evidence for it. There is no evidence for life on any asteroid, but then the chemistry is such that we can't rule it out somewhere. Life may not like me and you, really unicellular. Or something. Could be right, but right, there's no evidence for anything. But then there are a lot of because of the complicated chemistry on the surface, there's a lot of uh, yeah, complex molecules which are formed. Science fiction, <laughs> yeah, no, but there are because we actually have so you can this we know them because we took the rocks back to earth and we took them in the lab, right? So, mass spectrometer or something, but then. We also we can also observe, let's say for example, molecular clouds from where stars form, right, through telescopes, and we can take the spectra and see which molecular lines are in the spectra. And we found fairly complicated molecules. We found molecules. We even, we even found Buckminster Fullerene C60 on in space, right? We found alcohol in space, tons of it. By the way, we found we found some amino acid in space too. So it's not that uncommon because. If the if the if the if the part of the universe is seeing is is has the correct temperature uh, right and amount of either correct kind of ultraviolet radiation which can provoke chemical reactions you actually we you actually see that a lot of fairly complicated molecules are formed including carbon based molecules right 
And I mean, if you have Buckminster Fullerene, that's that's sorry, that, that's pretty complicated. You would think that that can only be formed in on Earth, right? So fa la fairly large organic molecules have been found in space anyway, right? On the right is uh, a close-up when Hayabusa landed. Now this is another asteroid which was visited by Osiris Rex in 2018. It it also gathered samples, but it hasn't reached Earth yet. It's going to reach uh, it's going to reach Earth uh, in September. Right, so you can and it's going to reach it's going to enter the earth's surface. Hopefully, it won't crash and burn, and then you get the sample. So that's really cool, right? And Bennu is interesting because Bennu has Bennu has a very high chance of impacting Earth sometime between 2178 and 2290, right? CE, the greatest risk being 2182. So therefore, that's why they went to Bennu to kind of study it a bit more and see what it was made of and so on. And therefore, this is how you kind of assess the risk, like the director said, right? And look at the look at the small little protuberances on the left. Oh, it's kind of cute. I think very cute asteroid. Okay, this I'll skip. Now, why do we have an asteroid day on 30th June? Do you know? Have you heard of Tunguska? Ah, the answer is here, right? So there was a very, very famous event. So, of course, we know the, the famous asteroid impact which killed the dinosaurs and all of that. But then in modern times, the biggest asteroid uh, impact event on Earth is the Tunguska event, which happened in eastern Siberia. Is very very with almost no population and therefore I think only I think nobody died or three people died okay because of the blast right and this happened on 30th June therefore 30th June is is marked as asteroid day to to bring awareness to the public of the dangers of asteroids but I think it's just fun to study about asteroids anyway okay? there's not to be all all catastrophe and doom and gloom huh I'm telling you so this was a so this asteroid came down to Earth. It did not hit the Earth's surface. It exploded in the atmosphere around 500 kilometers high. And the blast wave from that explosion flattened trees for, you know, tens of kilometers around. And that's an example of that, right? And it's on, it's, so therefore, you can estimate the size back from the energy which was released. Therefore, I estimated that it's around 50 to 60 meters in size. Okay. So, so this is a very, very famous event because this is in modern times. And though there was no uh, there was no much evidence because it was in a sparsely populated region in eastern Siberia, we 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 this is recorded by people there. Okay, and the blast wave, the three people who died was because of the blast wave which hits them, hit them, and some glass shattered or something. Right, so this is why 30th June is marked as asteroid day. And the other big thing, I don't know if you remember this. This happened 20. Oh, you all too young for 2030. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so this again was an asteroid around 18 meters, 18 meters size. Which again went through the went through Russia in the southern Urals, which of course had much more population, and this again exploded in in midair. But then it was but then it was captured by so the Russians had dash cams on their cars much before any other country had. Okay, and so all Russia had dash cam. Therefore, there are tons of dash dash cam footages of the Chelyabinsk explosion uh, by people. It looks like a missile. It's not a missile. It didn't land. It exploded in midair. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it impacted them, it would be even more damage. So it exploded midair. Therefore, nobody died, but then glass glass panes were shattered for like tons of for long distance and, and so on and so forth. Right? So this was this was a fairly large, large event by us by our standards. This is this kind of should make you slightly scared, right? Then, of course, then we come to the last bit about about dangers and so on. Have you all heard of that? Yeah. So this was done last year, right? This is really cool. So then you have you seen Armageddon or Mar, uh, Mars impact? Moonfall. Huh? Moonfall. Moonfall. I've, Armageddon was when I was young. Uh, Armageddon is this movie where asteroids are going to hit Earth, and I think Bruce Willis is sent up, and then he and then they bang into the asteroid, the asteroid splinters, and then there's not much damage to Earth, and he's saved. And of course, Morgan Freeman is a US president and all that. Have you seen that? Anyway, so so they thought, so now that we know more about asteroids and we know that the chance of one hitting us is not that small, we need to start preparing for it. The, the best way, the easiest way to do it, what people thought to try is just to hit the asteroid with enough momentum that it deflects from the orbit, which will bring it to Earth. One of the right? I don't we have to check. Uh, I don't know. We can look it up later. Right. And therefore, people thought that this is a good thing to test. Therefore, you hit the asteroid with enough momentum such that at, at a particular point in its orbit, such that you expect the orbit to be changed in such a way that it will no longer be 
hitting Earth. That's the idea. So they all test it out to see if we can do it. So what they did was there is a minor planet called asteroid called Dimorphos, which has a moon around itself called Didymos. So what they did was launch this DART spacecraft, and the spacecraft impacted Didymos on on in twenty twenty two. And it changes orbit dramatically. This is a, this, these are images taken from ground-based telescopes, right? So you can see the collision and and the vaporized dust thrown out from the asteroid, right? And then after that, they followed Didymos and they found out that it did change its orbit, so no sufficiently, and therefore they're going to try this more and more, right? Uh, is it clear what happened with that? Yeah. Okay. And. So this is take, these are the images taken from DART while it was hitting Didymos. So Dimorphos on the left, Didymos on the right, the moon, and DART is hitting hitting Didymos, right? So these are images sent from Didymos from DART before it hit. Oh, Ulta, is it? Sorry, okay. So this is the moon which they impacted. Three, two, one. And then impact. And then the camera was destroyed, of course, right? And what did you see? This is what they saw from ground. Slightly approaching Hollywood, slowly. No, <laughs> not bad. Okay. So that's that's enough about dangers and so on. So I just want to end with one slide about this is the last slide, right? Yeah, about asteroids and the connection to the connection to India itself. Uh, our institute dates back to 1786, uh, where uh, under the British there was something called the Madras Observatory, which was created. It has a long history, and it ha it's a long history in the history, it's a long tradition in the history of science itself. And we can talk about it some other day if you're interested. And uh, around 1830s or 40s, they got a new director called Norman Poxon, who was a very very famous astronomer. Uh, for example, the magnitude scales, you know, you know, stellar magnitude scales was was you know formulated by Poxon. The apparent magnitude scales were formulated by Poxon. When he was the UK, then he came to India, became director. He was the longest serving, one of the longest serving directors in Madras, and he was a very famous astronomer. And he discovered so many asteroids from Madras, right? So that was the first few asteroids discovered from India. Uh, on top, and then uh, in recent times, not recent, so around the 80s, there was a project in Kabul. Uh, with a 24-inch telescope to detect asteroids called Project Kalki. And the first asteroid discovered was called Ramanujam. And that's the discovery image. Uh, so from left to right, you can see that the asteroid, which is marked by arrows, changes position. So that was discovered in Kavalur and so on and so forth, right? And now in Hanle, in Ladakh, we have four telescopes, two optical and two Cherenko. And one optical telescope is called Growth India Telescope. That's a part of an international network called Growth Network. So we have telescopes all over the world in covering all longitudes so that you can see the sky at any given time. And they look for objects which either suddenly brighten or, or move, right? And then this data is all, from all the growth telescopes is put together every day through automatic pipelines to discover objects which suddenly become brighter, like novae and supernovae and something, or objects which move like asteroids. So, so our, the data from Hanley is fed into this larger database. And this discovered many more asteroids as well. So these are some of the Indian connections I can think of. The other, so how many of you know the Indian, uh, sorry, International Asteroid Search Campaign, the Citizen Science Program? No, I just end with this. This is really cool. I thought I'll have a demo, but then it's, uh, let's start. Uh, so have you heard of Citizen Science, Galaxy Zoo, Einstein at Home? No? Okay. So Citizen Science is a whole movement which started around 20 years ago or so, where, so, what do astron okay? What do you think astronomers do all day long? Huh? At night, they go in the daytime. What do you think astronomers generally do? They use selenium. Hey, that's only now. Yeah, what do astronomers do for like two hundred years? They observe the sun. They observe the sun, etc. Right. They calculate last night's uh, discoveries and. Uh, Correct. Right. <laughs> Galaxies, stars. So you collect data, and data usually was long back collected on photographic plates, right? So you observe the whole night, you get one photographic plate, and you analyze it later, right? Later, we got CCD cameras where you got slightly larger data. You could take CCD photos, at, let's say, every 15 minutes, so then you got more data. Nowadays, can you imagine the data coming in through telescopes? They're huge, right? So, so there, are, there are gigabytes of data coming every night. 
right? And the fused telescopes will have petabytes coming every night or every day, right? And therefore, what do you do with the data? Can I look at the data the next day and, and look at the gigabytes of data? I can't, right? So what do you do? So especially large data, so if I look at one particular object, then I can look at that data next few days, analyze the object, make the image, take a spectra and do something. But supposing I'm doing a survey of the sky, I want to see what I want imaging a lot of objects. I want to image like 10,000 galaxies. I want to take a spectra of thousand stars or something like that. Or I want to image the entire sky in radio or something. Then how, what do I do with the data? I had to automate it, right? I had to find some software or algorithm to go through the data and, and do what I wanted to do, right? Yeah. Uh, no, there was this uh, event in which the scientists blasted out the address of the earth from Puerto Rico. That could be right. So, so this, I'm talking about general, right? Generally, this is what people do these days. The size of data has become so large, right? That for a lot of applications, you need to have software. Now, what do you want to do? A lot of what you want to do with this data is to find what you want, right? So, the hidden in the data is some pattern you want, and and computer software can find these patterns, but not very well. But then humans are fantastic at pattern recognition. Right? You know that, right? So, I mean, we can recognize, distinguish between 100 faces, 100 faces of people standing like, you know, 30 meters away. We, the face recognition technology has companies and companies trying to do face recognition technology, right? So, pattern recognition comes very, very easily to humans, right? It's wired on our brains for some evolutionary reasons. Whereas, software finds it difficult to do it. And therefore, citizen science is a way to use this power of humans, right? So, what they do is large data sets. They have this front end where I say I have a large data set, right? Of uh, let's say uh, a million galaxies. I want to pick out those which are spiral and those which are elliptical. And I can do it, I can, computers won't do it that well. So what I do is I then make an interface where, where anybody can log in, create an account, and then we train you. So we show you images, is it a spiral or elliptical? You click. And then you, and you kind of, while doing it, you know it's wrong, it's right, and so on. So we have a training data set. And then you learn, we train you to recognize the pattern well. And then we show you the actual data, which we haven't looked at, right? And then we ask you to do the pattern recognition for us. And it's cross-checked by showing it to multiple people across the world, right? And this is a huge thing which is taken off 20 years ago called citizen science. And there are now at least an astronomy started this trend. Now, of course, there are citizen science projects in biology and chemistry and all that, but we started it. And now there are more than 20 such projects using new data taken from fancy telescopes which are available to you one of them is called the international asteroid search campaign where they have pictures of the same part of the sky taken today day after last month next month and so on they show it to you and then you see if something is moving something has changed its position then you mark it right and then you then they follow it up and then if it's actual asteroid you're discovered you can name it after yourself and that's something which has been which is now very popular among school students and colleges across the world including india a lot of camps which teach you this in India. And here are some of the headlines of a lot of schools in India discovering asteroids themselves. Discover not, not you personally, but then you would say, oh, there's something, something is moving here. Somebody will check it. Something happens, etc. It's a collective effort of anonymous people spread across the world, right? But collectively, all of you become astronomers to discover new things in data, which are too large for us to look at, right? And therefore, if you search for international asteroid search campaign, you'll find it and you can, you can start looking at it yourself. But there are many, many more. So if you look at Galaxy Zoo, Galaxy Zoo is a website which collects all the astronomy-related citizen science projects, right? You can search for gravitational waves. You can search for UFO signals. You can, you can classify galaxies. You can discover exoplanets. You can discover comets. There are so many different projects which you can do, which I think is really, really cool if you have a good Wi-Fi connection and a laptop, right? So I'll end with this. We'll have some questions. 11.